The official explanation for the destruction of World Trade Center Building 7 was given by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, also known as NIST, in late 2008. This presentation will help you understand why that official NIST explanation is false, because the collapse of Building 7 could never have started the way NIST says it did. For years, NIST promoted the hypothesis that diesel fuel fires, driven by diesel fuel tanks located within the building, had caused the collapse. But NIST abandoned that hypothesis in its final report. NIST also suggested for years that the damage caused by falling debris from the North Tower was a root cause of the collapse of Building 7. Ultimately, NIST gave up on that hypothesis as well. And contrary to some media reports, the building design was not an issue either. The NIST investigation began in May 2002, and NIST put out an interim report on Building 7 in 2004. Two years later, in 2006, NIST's lead investigator made it clear that they had little or no idea what happened to Building 7. We might wonder how anyone could have predicted this building would collapse, given that four years into the investigation, government scientists had no idea what happened. But in 2008, NIST said that what happened to Building 7 was obvious and that science was behind a new explanation. We're going to take a close look at NIST's final theory and discover for ourselves whether or not it is obvious. But we should remember that it is entirely computer-based. NIST did no physical testing at all to support its Building 7 report. Here's a photo of the area showing the critical column, column 79, that NIST said first failed in Building 7. NIST says fires on the northeast corner of Floor 12 heated the ceiling that included the floor beams for Floor 13, causing thermal expansion of the beams, which caused the girder at column 79 to fall off its seat. NIST says that column 79 buckled due to the loss of support from that girder and then the whole building collapsed in a matter of seconds. Here's a diagram that shows NIST's view of how the floor beams on the northeast side of the building, shown here as purple lines, pushed against the critical girder. The girder connected column 79 to the external wall at column 44. The girder to column connections blown up in the inset diagram, showing how NIST envisions that the girder was pushed off its seat. On the bottom here, you can see the pictures that NIST used in its media presentation. One of them unveiled its final report. The picture is reversed again, but you can see the general idea. The NIST interim report from 2004 said that most of the beams and girders were made composite or one piece with the slabs using shear studs. In a deceptive turnabout, NIST did a reversal in its final report and said that no studs were installed on any of the girders. Unfortunately for NIST, it was not just its own 2004 interim report that contradicted this vital aspect of its final theory. The presence of shear studs on all the girders was also described by John Salvarinus, the project manager for Building 7, from the company that supplied the steel components. This diagram from an academic paper that Salvarinus wrote in 1986 shows that there were 30 shear studs on that critical girder. NIST claims that thermal expansion caused the breakage of over 100 high-strength bolts. The mechanism that NIST claims called all the, caused all this damage is called differential thermal expansion. This is when the expansion of the beam is much greater than the expansion of the concrete floor slab above it. Thermal expansion is not a new phenomenon, as NIST suggests, but has been a consideration throughout the history of structural design. You can see that point made here by two building professionals from Australia who wrote a response to NIST on its Building 7 report. These building professionals reported that they had actually done physical tests to see what thermal expansion would do to floor assemblies. These were just the kinds of tests that NIST should have done. Because they had actually done the tests, the Australians were able to state that the shear studs would not fail because in a building fire, the floor slab was heated as well and the entire composite assembly would expand together. So NIST 
final theory is at odds with actual experimental evidence from the testing of real floor assemblies. Another thing we need to understand is just how far that girder would have had to be pushed for it to walk off its seat, as NIST suggests. NIST reported that the girder at column 79 was 11 inches wide, the seat, and therefore the girder had to be pushed at least 5.5 inches, or half of that distance, to walk off the seat. You can see that claim here in an excerpt from NIST's report. To repeat, NIST's final initial failure mechanism for Building 7 was that the critical girder was pushed 5.5 inches by the expanding floor beams. The 5.5 inches was needed in order for the vertical web of the girder, and therefore the center of mass of the girder, to move off of the seat. Because thermal expansion is a function of temperature, we need to know what temperature NIST says the beams reached so that we can estimate how much they expanded. This was a tricky question for NIST because at temperatures as high as 600 degrees Celsius, the steel will lose strength and stiffness and therefore not be able to extend into the girder. At the same time, if the temperature is not high enough, there wouldn't be enough expansion of the floor beams. What NIST settled on was the idea that the beam temperatures reached 400 degrees Celsius on the northeast corner of floor 12. On this slide you can see an example of just how tenuous NIST computer models were with respect to reality. NIST computer model had all the steel heating to extreme temperatures and all the bolts and other connections breaking within a matter of about two seconds. This is an example of how NIST computer modeling was not realistic. Once the temperature distribution needed for its theory was settled, NIST found a way to suggest that the differential thermal expansion could be possible, at least in the computer. They simply didn't heat the floor slab in the computer model. This is what most scientists would call fraud. But NIST theory has more problems than that. Given this temperature scenario, the amount of expansion by the beams would not satisfy the amount of, of expansion that NIST said was required, or five and a half inches. NIST provided an example of the equation that scientists use to calculate thermal expansion. When we put the correct values into the equation, we see that the maximum expansion would be only 3.3 inches. And as we already know from NIST, 3.3 inches would not be enough to cause the girder to walk off its seat. We know from the physical dimensions of the girder and the seat that the girder would have had to be pushed at least 5.5 inches for this very improbable scenario to even begin. Another thing NIST said was that there were 7-hour fires in Building 7, which gave the impression that the fires were very long and very hot but early photographs did not show fires on floors 11 through 13 where NIST said the first failures occurred until after 2 o'clock. And the building fell less than three and a half hours later, so there could not have been seven hour fires. Underwriters Laboratories provided the fire resistance information for Building 7. There were requirements for fire resistance of the columns and floor steel in Building 7, just as there is for any skyscraper. The requirements were that these steel components had to withstand two to three hours of intense fire in standard tests. One big contradiction that NIST avoided is that its investigators knew that the fire load in the building would only support about 20 minutes of fire in a given area. When the NIST report talks about several hours of fire, it is deceptively talking about the time a fire lasts anywhere on a floor, not in one specific location. Underneath a floor beam, for example, the fire time is only about 20 minutes, as this exchange from a NIST advisory committee meeting indicates. We should be able to verify how long the fires lasted in a given location because there are photographs available from various times during the day. But it turns out that NIST did not use the photographs to verify its computer simulations. As you can see from this comparison of a photo in NIST's report, taken at about 10 minutes to 4, and the NIST simulation of fires on floor 12 at the same time, 
there's no correlation between NIST simulation and what really happened. At approximately 4 o'clock, NIST computer simulation shows raging fires across the north side windows of floor 12. The photo from about the same time shows no fires in that area at all. NIST admits that its models did not use, quote, the observed fire activity from photos and videos as a model input, unquote. Again, this is not scientist, science, and this is another example of why the NIST report is false. Regardless of the fact that the NIST World Trade Center 7 report is false in many ways, we would all like to see how NIST reached its conclusions, but we're not allowed to see those things. NIST tells us that release of that information might jeopardize public safety. But our safety has actually been jeopardized by NIST itself and its lies about what happened at the World Trade Center. NIST failed to explain why and how Building 7 collapsed, and a new investigation is needed. Please see the following websites for more information and for a chance to help. Thanks for listening.